isolate or to integrate? That's the challenge the Indian government face over the future of a tribe whose history dates back to the Stone Age. The reclusive Joara people live on the Andaman Islands, but their lifestyle is threatened by poachers, loggers and tourists. I'm Cathy Hearn. On this edition of 101 East, we ask if India can protect an ancient tribe on the verge of extinction. It's a privacy issue, it's a voyeuristic issue. You're basically selling a chance to see other human beings. I don't think that's right at all. We are here to see the Jarawas people, the tribal people, and we are excited to see them like, like they are not civilized. These are human beings, these are not animals in a zoo. These are not some specimens, you know. Unspoiled white sand beaches, turquoise water and spectacular diving. It's a holiday maker's paradise, the kind of place travelers like to keep hidden for themselves. But the economy is heavily subsidized, and although the coconuts are local, everything else is imported. I've traveled to the Andaman Islands, an archipelago of more than 570 small islands lying in the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean. Less than 10% of this area is inhabited. The rest is covered by vast tropical rainforests, home to rare and exotic wildlife. It's also home for several Aboriginal tribes, protected for thousands of years by their isolation. But as tourism develops, this isolation is under threat. Tour operator Mohammed Sajid runs a company called Andaman Escapades. He's a qualified engineer, but says tourism pays better. Tourism in Andaman is still not an organized sector. People who find an opportunity in doing a business or find an opportunity for getting an earning out of it, everyone joined this tourism revolution in Andaman. Tourists are our bread, our bread and butter for us. We need to serve them. But only up to an extent, up to where it's ethical and legal. As our expedition approached the curiously called... The Sanskrit word Andaman means land of the naked people and refers to several groups of Stone Age tribes who populate the islands. One of these tribes is the reclusive Jarawa. It was only in 1998 they first made contact with the outside world. They are believed to be the direct descendants of the first human beings that came out of Africa millions of years ago. They still use a bow and arrows to hunt and gather seeds and berries to eat. Today, they live in a 1,000 kilometer square protected reserve in the middle of South Andaman Island. They are totally different from ourselves. They are not developed as we are. So I wanted to see how they are living and what, what, is, what are they doing here. It's 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and tourist buses are lining up, waiting to pass through the checkpoint into the reserve. It's a chance for locals to earn some money selling tea and snacks. The vehicles here must travel in convoy. Official records show about 250 vehicles pass through here daily, most of them carrying tourists. This is the Andaman Trunk Road. It's the only road that links the whole of the island from the south to the north for a distance of about 300 kilometers. The problem is, for about 40 kilometers, it passes through the Jaro Tribal Reserve. Under Indian law, any contact with the tribe's people is banned, including filming or photographing them. But over the past decade, tour operators have used the road to take convoys of tourists on human safaris. A few tour operators and a few people I found it as a money-making opportunity. To take people through to see to the Jawas. To Jawas. It was clearly maintained and told to people not to take photographs, not to take pictures. But 100 times you tell them, still they go and take photos from inside, from corner. Now what a driver can do? How, he, how can he stop a person taking photos? So would you say the tourists then are more at fault? It wasn't the tour operators, it was the tourists? Everyone is equally responsible. Anyone who travels on this particular stretch of Andaman Trunk Road, passing through the Jarwa home, is involved in a safari. 
if they get a chance to click a photo of the jarwa to offer them food or offer them tobacco or things like that and it's like looking at the jarwa as animals in a safari park they are humans like us they are not aliens they are not animals you just imagine if somebody comes to you and offers you in, in fact not offering you it's like throwing some biscuits and throwing money and uh, giving you tobacco making you dance Tour groups pass through the Jarawa Reserve on their way to visit the limestone caves and mud volcano of Baratang Island. But it's the Jarawa along the ATR who are the main attraction. And at roughly $90 a passenger, it's a lucrative business for the tour operators and an exotic adventure for the tourists. Curiosity. Curiosity. Jarawa. The Jarawa, the tribals, we are curious about them. We have heard that the tribals who live here are just as they used to be. There's no change in them. That's why they are worth seeing. I don't know how we stop that, you know, because it's a very, it's a, a you know, big uh, something to go home and say, you know, I saw the Jarvas. You say, oh, yeah, those guys, it's going to be like that. People would like to see them. But there are other tribes also, which... Uh, are there in different areas. The problem with this particular tribe is that it is on half an island. In January, a British news report published details of a video that appeared to show police making Jarawa women dance for tourists in return for food. The footage provoked a stream of international criticism, but the local police chief says the response is exaggerated. A lot of it stems from the fact that it is sensational, it is slightly uh, titillating. So, and especially the media channels, oh, they really went to town on it because it, it made very good uh, TRPs for them. They, and uh, as a matter of fact, if you noticed, I mean, every five minutes they were showing that clip. Nobody was encouraging. See, when you meet a Jarva, it is his natural reaction or her natural reaction to dance and naturally i mean uh, it did come out in some papers that the police made them da dance naked well they are always naked and i don't think anybody was you know forcing them to dance or anything like that but to say that this is happening all the time and that you know i mean i don't think uh, the police is that bored on duty out there <laughs> The media uproar reignited a decades-old campaign to have the Andaman Trunk Road, or ATR, closed to preserve the Jarawa's privacy. But for the island's half a million other inhabitants, closing the road is not an option. Many trucks use the ATR to transport goods across the island. The ATR is today the lifeline of the Andaman Islands. 200,000 people living outside Port Fair in North Andamans, Middle Andaman, Baratang, survive on it for their daily needs food, medicine, clothes, cooking oil, everything goes through that road. So we really don't think we are in a position right now to really close the ATR on the Jarva area. This is despite a 2002 ruling from the Supreme Court of India that ordered the road to be closed. The Andaman administration says it's still appealing the verdict. The debate over closing the road has also triggered discussion over how the Jarawa are treated. When I was a child, people used to tell stories about the Jarawa. Dennis Giles has spent many years fighting for the rights of the Jarawa. I started feeling, feeling for the tribe. And the journey started way back in 1999. So this was the first time when I travelled in Andaman Trunk Road. I happened to meet some members of the tribe there. I was really scared because my, uh, it was like uh, a kind of notion in my mind that okay, they will attack me, they will just lick the arrow and they shoot and it's a poison and people die and they are very hostile, they cut people, they kill people and all these stories were there but when I personally, the first meeting, first interaction with them, it changed my mind. <laughs> like I really felt like no, they are quite simple and they are, their brain is like almost like a teenager or little children. So simple, so clean, so pure. Dennis is the editor, reporter and publisher for a local newspaper called Andaman Chronicle. Every night he prints out copies to be sold around Port Blair. 
He always includes information about the Chihuahua on the front page. Two years ago, he also started up a small NGO, aiming to raise awareness about the Chihuahua. He says the tour groups on the ATR are invading the tribe's privacy, but he also blames the police for teaching the tribe to beg and accept bribes. Look at the behavior of the police. They are meant, they are meant to be protecting the Jarwa by, getting, uh, by being posted in that area. And what have they done? The Jarwa believed that the people who wear khaki and all, they are very powerful because they have guns and things like that. So they got really attracted to the police. And in return, what they got is like tobacco, alcohol. They were sexually abused by the police. The police is always more visible and the first, uh, first thing you can criticize is the police. But I think we have done a very good job till now. There always will be the human, uh, the two or three boys who make a mistake. One of them allowed himself to be shot in the same frame. I mean, they have been taken to task very, very severely. And I think uh, now they've understood how serious this matter is. Otherwise, for them, uh, Jarva is just like any other human being. Initially, police downplayed the British news report, saying the footage was old. But as more details came to light, they were forced to investigate. Police have arrested several people, including two of their own. And in early March, were again embarrassed after a senior policeman, specifically charged with protecting the Jaroa, was caught organizing a human safari for his relatives. He was in charge of that area. So that is why people have made a big thing out of it. And he's been transferred. Now, people are saying, why wasn't he arrested? Why wasn't he this? He has not gone and taken photographs and put them on the internet. Right? But he did take his relatives to go and see the tribal okay, that people. Was, that was a lapse. I have nothing really to say about that because I think uh, he's had enough of a reversal in his career. It's not a minor thing to be sent back. As head of the police, what are you doing to protect the Jara at the moment? Well, firstly, the convoy system. Secondly, we have our Jarawa protection post. You must understand that earlier, we were protecting the settlers from the Jarvas. That's why all these posts were set up, to make sure that the Jarvas did not attack them, because they used to. Till about the 1990s or so, there were instances of them attacking the settlers, coming out. But now, the purpose is to make sure that the settlers do not go into their area. It is not possible really to insulate them totally. Police Chief SBS Diol says the recent negative publicity has resulted in increased awareness. The positive thing is that I have managed to use that as a handle and get after the tour operators and really clamp down on everybody. This policy of zero tolerance seems to be working. Convoys have been halved and police now follow the cars to make sure they don't stop. Things have changed very drastically. People still come. Uh, people, the number of uh, vehicles going through the convoy has been reduced drastically. Police is very strict these days. Even people still are asking people to go. Everything boils down to that 4,000 rupees you get for a vehicle a day. If once it is stopped, everything will stop. We need to find very quickly, we need to find alternative destinations, alternative activities. We really want to be very careful how they interact with the outside world. Not because we feel they can't be trusted, but the fact that that interaction can be misused, misrepresented, and it would work to the detriment of the Jarawas. So right now, to allow anybody with a camera or a paper and a pen to go in and start interviewing them and shooting them, that I think for the timing will just not be possible. The issue is now so sensitive that our crew was asked to stop filming Jarawa statues outside the governor's house. While other Jarawa statues in Port Blair have now been removed. As the police clampdown continues, local government head Shakti Sinha is implementing new policies to protect the Jarawa. Is the administration response too little too late? No, I don't think so. 
the fact remains that this is an evolving situation. Our lifestyle and their lifestyle right now are quite divergent. If you want to impose a health or an educational solution onto them, or ideas onto them, possibly likely to backfire and actually damage them. We try to walk a very fine line, protecting them and yet not keeping them in isolation. Dennis Giles is critical of the government's efforts and says the tribe risks being wiped out. If we interfere more without a mind to help them out, they'll be destroyed. There are hardly 400 people and one case of AIDS or HIV can make this tribe extinct within no time. Already they had measles, malaria and such diseases because of us. And one case of HIV or something, it will destroy the tribe. In 1999 and 2006, the Jarawa suffered outbreaks of measles, a disease that's been responsible for wiping out other tribes worldwide. The government says this is why the tribe needs to be kept isolated. We're not very sure, but we like to be careful. We like to be very, very careful because we really don't know. We are separately studying their medical status. We've been involved not just the doctors, but anthropologists also to understand their system of medicine. And the fact is that most of these tribes have not been exposed to the illnesses that we are exposed to. The antibodies that we have with us, they don't have it. Shakti Sinha says despite the threats, the tribe is healthy. And the numbers are growing for the first time in over a hundred years. If you go to see the Jaravals here and they move around, the very large number of small children under the age of 10. Now that is a sign that it's a society much more comfortable with the outside world. Because a society under threat would not be having numbers going up the way it is going now. What are you doing to protect the Jarawa tribe? One, of course, we have a very large area where the outsiders are not allowed at all. And in fact, the area has been increased in 2004 directly. We added about 200 square kilometers to what is called the Jarawa Reserve. Later on, we have also added a further belt of five kilometers around the Jarawa Reserve, where we, the buffer zone, where we don't allow any commercial activity really in the major sense of the term. Yes, there are villages there, they have their normal lives, we don't want to affect that, because we don't want a conflict between the villagers and the Jaravas, but we do not want large-scale commercial development. So no hotels, no resorts, no bars, no entertainment parks, nothing like that in that five kilometer zone. So our whole idea is to allow the Jarava enough space to develop in a manner that they want to develop. But many on the island believe the buffer zone has come at a cost to local development. We plan to run with the six tents for the first few years. These are the platforms where the tents had come up, so we actually had everything here and running and we ran it for a season. Samit Sani was given permission to build a back-to-nature eco-resort outside Port Blair, but he was forced to close it down after the five-kilometre buffer zone was put in place around the reserve. The tap works. <laughs> he says there's no real basis in law for the buffer zone and has challenged it in court for over two years. It's been a huge financial drain because running a, uh, running a case in the Supreme Court is very expensive. The government says Summit's resort would encourage travellers to seek out the Jarawa, an accusation Summit denies. There's absolutely no way we would encourage anybody going anywhere into the reserve. In fact, as a travel company, we have never sold a package that takes you onto the ATR either, leave alone from long before this became an issue. As a policy, we were the first company out here to say we will not do Jarawa tours. Summit says the administration has been haphazard about enforcing the rules, and if they were serious, then they would close down the ATR. Today, his resort stands empty. But instead of ensuring privacy for the Jarawa, Local villagers come here every weekend to party, leaving behind a trail of litter and noise. Summit says the Jarawas are no longer as isolated as outsiders believe. First of all, I think preserve the Jarawa itself is a loaded statement because what are you preserving them for and in what state are you preserving them in? And what is it that they actually want, which nobody has actually asked. 
you haven't talked with other Pradhans or everything. One person who has asked the Jarawa what they want is Mohan Halder, a locally elected village leader. Mohan says the Jarawa are facing problems with their food supply because poachers and loggers are destroying their habitat. There are plenty of expectation from me actually. Whenever they are talking with me, they are running. They, whenever they are getting to me, they run to me and coming and first approach is that, have you brought any biscuit? Have you anything to for any food with me, with you to uh, to get uh, to, uh, to get uh, so that I can uh, fill my hungriness? That is the first question. It is very hard for me to uh, uh, change the topic. He's concerned that the current police policy of sending them back into the jungle is pointless. Most of the time, they are saying that that, that we want to stay here in these uh, villages. But these police departments are coming, they are saying, you have to go right now, you have to go in the deep jungles. And police are sending them in the 20, uh, 20 miles away. And after that, they are again walking 12 hours or 30 hours. After that, they are again coming to the village. So they are suffering. So that's why they have the fear that the police department will send them in the deep jungles and they, will, they have to again walk 30 kilometers to come up in this area. Yeah. Moen says many of the tribe now want the benefits of modern life a roof over their heads, cooked food and protection from poachers. They have uh, set up their mind to get everything what the civilized persons are getting. A few days ago, uh, they were uh, demanding for the phone also. That's why I again requesting to the government of India that uh, time has come up, enough is enough. Let them civilize these peoples, educate these peoples. We get good Jarwa, healthy children. We get a better society there. We make them permanent shelters for them in the deep jungles. We make them village and in this way we can increase them from 400 to 10,000 in numbers. Moan says the Jarawa policy urgently needs to be reconsidered. He says the buffer zone is no solution as it stops the local villagers accessing employment opportunities. We should educate the Jarwas. The time has come up to make them civilize, to make them educate. They have very strong remembrance power, very strong intellectual ability they have. They have very good strength of sporting abilities. And they are very sporting and we should educate them and develop their communities. So you're saying that the Jara want to integrate? Yeah, they, they, they are very much eager and all the time they are requesting, Pradhanji, you help us. We are in, 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 a, in a distress, we want help from you. You talk to the higher authorities and you uh, better make the system so that we can get food, we get education, we get clothes, we get everything. Everything they are demanding from me but I cannot give them. Moen says the modern world can also learn from the Jarawa and their strong relationship with nature, especially traditional medicine. Every disease, uh, we suffering, they are also suffering, but they have their own uh, vegetable, uh, vegetation uh, medicines that is called Ayurvedic medicines. I feel they have a strong sea of medicinal knowledges in them. Activists are concerned that if the Jarawa are assimilated into mainstream society, the jungle will no longer be protected and the tribe will be pressured by developers to sell their land. Without the jungle, their way of life will disappear. If they join the mainstream, they will be made to come to Port Blair and work like labourers out here. So it is almost like losing their land and we try to occupy that land. We destroy the forest, we, destroy the, we exploit the resources like anything, we, we convert it into a settlement area and ultimately it will become a concrete jungle like what we are sitting here. But the government says the Jarawa land is safe. There's no question of reducing the Jarawa reserve. The very fact that as recently as 2004 we added 241 square kilometers, the question of there being squeezed is not on the cards anywhere. There are no easy answers for authorities tasked with protecting this ancient tribe but the need to balance respect for their traditional way of life whilst acknowledging their right to modernize will be crucial for their survival. <laughs>